Hi there, my name is Andrew Howe. You might know me as Grapes from any of these places, or Grapes with an X for an A from your local Silver One Solo queue games. You're currently watching a small army of my younger cousins forcibly accessorize me with a trademark Disney Frozen 2 cosmetic set. It's one of those videos I have saved on my phone that I look back on sometimes to remember all the great times I had with my family before the pandemic. Look how much fun they're having. It's almost metaphorical in a way. While makeup is supposed to be a tool used to accentuate beauty and promote attractiveness, when the materials used end up being significantly below standard and are used by people who don't know what they're doing on an unwilling individual, the results are, well, less than ideal. Did you hear that? Did, did you hear what I did? No? Alright, one sec. <clears throat> While makeup is supposed to be a tool used to accentuate beauty and promote attractiveness, when the materials used end up being significantly below standard, and are used by people who don't know what they're doing on an unwilling individual, the results are less than ideal. Yeah! <laughs> My offbeat and convoluted cold open aside, there's a big problem in the North American professional League of Legends scene. For as long as I've followed LoL Esports, all I've watched is year after year of NA teams underperforming internationally. After each underwhelming performance, we get the same how to fix NA rants every time on social media, where people mauled and argue about how we need to move the servers back to LA, that we need less one tricks on the solo queue ladder, or that we need to start spending more and more money on imports. The thing is, all these solutions really miss the point. They're all band-aid fixes, and just like real band-aids, they only serve as a protective barrier used to shield the user from potential danger, and don't do much to fix the problem that lies underneath. Our region doesn't need more imports. We just need better player development. Just take a look at EU. Remember when NA and EU were on even playing fields, both equally far from the gods that were Korea and China? Well, the introduction of EU Masters in 2019 saw a shift towards player development in Europe, and has brought EU up to par in international success with the East. In an effort to follow suit, Riot founded the LCS Proving Grounds in Spring 2021. This new amalgamation between Academy and Semi-Pro opens the door for hundreds of games to be played by new, young NA talent with competitive aspirations. I've been following and casting a lot of the games this past split, and it's been absolutely incredible to see these new superstars arise and prove their worth, as the name suggests. But with so many new players to watch and so many games to analyze, how can we actually determine who has potential to be NA's next star? Could there be some new specific method, perhaps using statistics and graphs in video format, to help find our new rising stars? I don't know, maybe. Hope we find it. Oh, you you meant this show. <laughs> this is not this show. If you want some real analysis on Proving Grounds, go ask some of these guys. They know their stuff. Me? Well, I'm just a guy who has way too much time on his hands and likes looking at numbers. We're going to talk about whatever I have on my mind, whether you like it or not. If it helps pinpoint new stars for NA, great. If not, well, at least we had some fun along the way. All this is, after all, is some fruit for thought. So, who are the stars of Proving Grounds? Scouting players in North America has been the topic of conversation and criticism for a very long time. While the semi-pro scene has provided so many more high elo players an opportunity to showcase their skills on a larger, more competitive stage, with so many games going on at a time and with so many teams and so many different levels of experience and skill, finding those diamonds in the rough can still be a challenge for LCS organizations. If someone is on a bad team, does that make them bad, or are their teammates too heavy? Likewise, if someone's team makes a good run, are they bound for the LCS, or did they get carried? Since wins and losses seem to be a poor way to determine player ability and potential, let's try using individual stats. Right now, you're looking at individual player data for every single official League of Legends game played by either an academy or amateur team in the spring split. Big thank you to Tim over at Oracle's Elixir for having all this beautiful data available at the ready. If a player is a good prospect, they should probably be able to pit up big numbers and carry their team. When I think of carrying a game, I think of somebody picking up pentakills and dealing tons of damage on route to a victory. But pure damage numbers definitely aren't everything. Gold income is also important. 
If a player gets more gold, they'll have more items, which generally means they do more damage. Is a player with more resources better than one who doesn't get as much just because they deal more damage? Maybe, but not necessarily. Every team has a unique dynamic. Early ganks and late game farm are given to different players depending on the circumstance. But I want to know how good a player could be if they were each placed in the same situation. So I created a new stat. My awesome new statistic shows just how efficiently a player is able to take the resources they are given and turn it into damage to help their team. It's pretty easy to calculate. You take a player's total team damage share and divide it by their total gold share. Values over 1 are good, since it means the player is able to turn their income into a large proportion of their team's damage. Conversely, values under 1 mean maybe the gold would have been better in the hands of someone else. What is this new stat called, you might ask? Well, all it does is calculate how well a player can convert allocated resources readily into excessive damage. Huh, I guess that works. Is the carried value the new hot be-all end-all statistic that will be used by analysts everywhere to determine how good a player is without even looking at win-loss records? Absolutely not. There are countless reasons this new stat is problematic and is not the best way to measure player skill. We'll tackle some of these problems later. But even if this isn't the best way to rank the skills of everyone in Proving Grounds, it can give us some insight on some of the scene's top players, and even help us learn about how the game is played and understood. Let's take a look at some graphs. To start off, here are the cumulative carried values for each role in the game. The main takeaway from this chart is that for the most part, all the positional values are near 1, which means that no position has superinflated numbers and are, at least generally, comparable to one another. We'll get back to this chart a little bit later. Our next exhibit shows the carried values of all the champions that were picked at least once in the spring split in either Academy or Amateur. The most interesting takeaway I got from this chart was that 143 out of the 153 available champions were picked at some point in the split. In a game that people often describe as having a pretty rigid meta, I was pleasantly surprised to see that such a high amount of champion diversity existed. The second most interesting fact I got from this chart was that Maokai sits at the top of the chart with an absolutely insane 1.672 carried value. I was confused at first. Surely there must have been some mistake in my calculations. The sample size was large, about 60 games, and when I went to check back at the individual game log, 8 of the 9 highest carried value games were Maokai's. What happened? Oh right, preseason happened. <laughs> oh right, games. The item rework in Season 11 saw the birth of the monstrosity now known as Imperial Mandate Maokai Support. This sapling tossing abomination terrorized solo queue and competitive alike, and Proving Grounds was no exception. The Risen Champions League group stage, one of the only semi-pro events played on patch 11.1, saw 24 games of Maokai support. The Maokais in those games contributed to 19.9% .9 of their team's damage, while only receiving 9.4% of the team's gold, yielding something I didn't even know was possible. A carried value over 2. So yeah, makes sense that our friend from the forest is at the top. Let's see who's keeping him company. Champions with high carried values this split tended to fall into one of three camps. The first are champions with small sample sizes, maybe only one or two games played. Number two, heavy artillery mages or AP supports like Zareth, Brand, Jace, or Ziggs. These guys are able to dish out tons of spells from a pretty safe distance, meaning they're generally able to do more damage over the course of the game than some of their shorter range counterparts. The third group was most interesting to me. Niche champions that were only considered to be pocket picks for certain players. There's pre-jungle buff Rumble for Captain Shrimps at 8, Malawi for Dragoon and Quas at 19, Nasus again for Quas at number 30, and of course, AP Azarelli and Soul at rank 18. These players have thousands of games on these champions, and when they get their hands on their main, they know how to utilize it to its fullest potential. I could talk about every champion on this list for hours on end, but to save you the time, I'll just stick to a few things that caught my eye in particular. There's Senna at 34. Senna was a champion I thought was going to be a huge outlier with her fasting playstyle, but actually ended up tamer than I expected. This is probably because farming Senna was a large part of the meta for the beginning of the season. Gangplank is at 40, which is pretty high especially when you consider the amount of inherent gold generation he gets with his parlay. To contrast, here are Draven and Pike near the bottom. While these guys do have gold generation in their kits, they aren't as good at turning it into damage like GP. The champion with the highest gold share in the game is Yasuo, 
However, his comparatively low damage share means that he only sits at rank 125. Also near the bottom of the barrel were a lot of the utility junglers that were prevalent for such a large part of the season, like Udyr, Skarner, Kundal, and Ivern. With most of their value coming from utility and not damage, it makes sense to see them down here. At second to last we see Senna's most common fasting partner in Tom Kench. While he does collect a lot of the farm in the early game, he's still Tom Kench, and essentially only has one offensive ability considering Devourer is almost always used on allies in competitive play. And then, finally, there's Tarek. Easy on the eyes? Don't I know it. We covered a lot today. But our initial question still remains unanswered. How do we use this carried value to discover any new talent in North America? Well, I think you're going to like my answer. Cumulative carried values for every player in Academy and Amateur, ranked by position, and with graphs made by Gofarino? Oh boy, you're definitely not going to want to miss this. I'll see you next time.